let us invite Dr. Puna to start this Dharma sharing. Is it wrong to be rich? Over to you, Dr. Puna. Thank you, brother. Just give me a second while I settle this. Okay, can I have confirmation that you can see my screen? Can I have confirmation that the screen can be seen? Yes. It's Thank clear. you. Thank you. Number of the Dyer Dhamma family in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and scattered all over the world. Tonight, we have reached the 23rd talk in our series. As you may know, there is a total of 25 talks. And after the 25th talk, the team will take a break because I can understand it is very demanding and tiring for the IT professionals who are involved. They have been working every week for almost half a year, managing the 16 sites in which this is broadcast. But we will return after a break as we do not wish to disappoint the four, average of 4,000 views that we get every week. And we will very lightly do it as a bi-monthly talk so that the IT team is not overtaxed. Details will come on as the planning progresses. But for tonight, we have reached the 23rd and we are talking with regards to whether it is wrong to be rich. And very often there's this myth that people think that Dhamma family people should be suffering lifelong, should be depriving themselves of many things. And it is time we settle this and clarify exactly what did the Buddha teach with regards to wealth. Now, you can be materially rich or spiritually rich, or you can be rich in both aspects, both materially and spiritually. And the point is that with wisdom, whether you are materially or spiritually or in both aspects rich, wise people have found meaning and purpose in their lives beyond just making money. For the Buddha, it is very clear that true happiness does not come from having material objects alone. Being poor and hungry didn't bring happiness either. And the Buddha, for all of us here who are familiar with his story before his enlightenment, had actually had both extremes a life of relative luxury 2,600 years ago, and a life of extreme asceticism. Now, the important thing is that we must have enough resources for everyone's needs. And if one, at a personal level, has more than that, then to use every opportunity for generosity. From the Buddha's own personal life, from his direct experience, the Buddha realized that hunger made it impossible to develop wisdom and compassion. And he tried. He really tried torturing his body, starving himself, depriving himself of all material comforts. And he realized that it is impossible. One does not get wisdom by torturing the body. Post-awakening, the Buddha continued to live a very simple but comfortable life. He ate moderately, he slept in moderately comfortable environment, and he even gave regulations and guidelines on how to clothe themselves, how much of cloth should they use, etc., to provide relative comfort. So, when we understand this, 
we understand that what the Buddha taught in his very first teaching in the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta is actually the middle way. Very often when we ask what's the very first teaching in the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, the first discourse, many people will say, oh, the Four Noble Truths. But no, the first verbal teaching is the verbal teaching of the middle way. The middle way between the extremes of luxury and ascetism or self-deprivation. The Buddha taught us the middle way. The first teaching the Buddha gave without words is the teaching of gratitude. When the Buddha spent the first thing, the first hours after awakening in gratitude to the Bodhi tree for sheltering him. So how might this influence us, Dhamma family, in terms of our wealth acquisition and spending? Now it is obvious that none of us here can have peace of mind when we are worried about financial affairs and debts. And COVID-19, unfortunately, has driven many, many families, many, many centers, many, many NGOs into stresses over financial affairs and debts. Many NGOs taking care of handicapped, special needs people are now in dire need of support because many of the supporters themselves have got into financial trouble. For us who are householders, this is suffering. Poverty is suffering. And remember, the aim of the Buddha Dharma is to lessen progressively all forms of dukkha. And this includes poverty. Now, lay people have to maintain a livelihood. No one owes us a living. That's why in the Mangala Sutta, it is clearly stated that one great auspicious thing that you and I can have is this ability to have vast learning and skills so that we can support our family and contribute to society. Basic needs must be met before one can concentrate on any form of spiritual development. Now, poverty deprives people of these basic needs and even the opportunity to offer requisites to help others, dana. And the Buddha very clearly taught us that poverty is one of the causes of social problems, crime and violence. In one particular discourse, it is clearly taught to the king that if you wish to reduce social problems, crime and violence, it is not by making harsher laws, harsher regulations. It is by making sure everyone had land to till, agriculture, food to eat, education. So wealth by itself, Dhamma family, is neither praised nor reproved. We are only concerned with how it is accumulated and how it is going to be used. If wealth is righteously obtained, without hurting people, without hurting the environment, without violence, stealing, lying, and deception, in short, maintaining the five precepts, then that is blameless, that is righteous wealth. And I had shared many a times that among the many spiritual traditions within the Buddha Dharma, right livelihood is a factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. What this clearly means that our livelihood itself is a spiritual path and hence right livelihood, something that we are involved in for many hours of every day of our lives is also spiritual practice. Now there is a sutta not very popular and not very well known in Anguttara Nikaya, Book of Trees, 
the 29th discourse, and it is called the blind. In this discourse, the Buddha describes that there are three kinds of people in the world. Now, which among us here, which category do we fall into? And the Buddha said, there's the blind people, then the people with just one eye, and then the people with two eyes. And the first category, the Buddha said, is the blind person. He does not know how to generate wealth. He does not know what is right and wrong. And he does not know what is good and bad. So this blind person ends up neither making much wealth or generating much wealth, nor doing good works. He is just drifting along. And there are many, many members of society who are like that, just drifting along. Then the Buddha talked of the one-eye person. And this person knows how to generate wealth. But this person doesn't know what is blameworthy or not, what is good, what is unwholesome. And this person may obtain wealth, the Buddha said, through whatever means, including violence, theft, and deception. And though he will definitely enjoy much sense pleasures from his accumulated wealth, he similarly creates unwholesome karma at the same time. Just now, when we recited the five precepts, the third precept we say, Kamesu Michachara. Very often, Kamesu Michachara is translated as sexual abuse. But Kamesu comes from the root word K-A-M-A. -A. Not K-A-M-M-A, -M -A, but K-A-M-A, which means sensual, like in Kama Sutra. Sensual. And sensual can be anything, not just sexual, but any abuse. So while this person will definitely enjoy sensual pleasures, he creates unwholesome karma because he does not know what is right, wrong. He does not bother how his wealth is accumulated. This is the one-eyed person. And in the third category, the Buddha said, the two-eyed person knows how to generate wealth. But he also knows what is right and wrong, blameworthy or not, good or evil. And this person similarly will accumulate wealth in this life without breaking the five precepts, without harming the environment. And at the same time, because of his good, wholesome actions, he creates good karma. For which among these three categories do you and I fall into? How much wealth should a Buddhist have? This is an interesting question, isn't it, Dhamma brothers and sisters? First, there are no restrictions on how much wealth a Buddhist should have, unless, of course, he is a monk or a nun. There are rich Buddhists around the world, and many of them use their wealth to do a lot of good. There are rich Buddhists in Johor Bahru itself that I am familiar with, that I know personally, and many of them are people in the third category with two eyes who earn, who accumulate their wealth without breaking the five precepts, and who use their money to do a lot of good things. So for us Buddhists, what matters is how people get their money, how they relate to it, and what they do with it. Let us be the two I category. Recall, Dhamma family, that even though you may not be committing any legal crimes, it is still possible to get rich with, for example, not being fair to your workers or from an industry that harms the environment. We are all familiar with the five professions 
that were listed 2,600 years ago as not suitable. But 2,600 years later, there is so much more beyond those five professions, including selling cigarettes, doing all kinds of destructive chemicals, polluting the environment, etc. And of course, there are some people who gain wealth because with wealth, they want to have power. Such lifestyles, of course, is not right livelihood and certainly unhelpful to developing wisdom and compassion. So how do we value wealth? First, for all of us who are lay people, you need clothes, food and shelter. You need to provide for your family, education for your children. Without the ability to provide for these things, a spiritual life is a luxury. So for those of us who are now able to fulfill our family duties and pursue a spiritual life, we are actually very, very rich. We are very blessed. Craving, as you know, or greed, is one of the three poisons which the Buddha knows is a cause of suffering. Now, genuine happiness does not come from the mere accumulation of wealth fueled by greed and attachment to material professions, possessions. Because if you do this, even the whole world is not enough. We are familiar with the three poisons of greed or desire, hatred or ill will, ignorance or delusion. So your worth, my worth, does not depend on how much money you and I have. And it is not to say money is good or bad. Because if you have money and you use that money well, it can do a lot of good for everyone. The Adiya Sutta lists three main benefits of wealth for lay people. A lay person can use his wealth to provide comfort and satisfaction for themselves, family, and friends. So do not by any means feel guilty if you have earned your wealth righteously and you will now use that wealth to provide comfort, good food, good entertainment for your family, for your family, friends, for your extended family, and for yourself. You do not have to feel guilty. Keep yourself safe. In those days, they talk about safe from thieves and from kings. Now it is make sure you have insurance, make sure you have medical insurance, make sure you don't get robbed or cheated. And of course, a lay person can use his wealth to make offerings to monks, nuns, and the needy. So the middle path, the Buddha Dharma does not in any way condemn wealth for one's enjoyment as long as you are not overly attached and ceaselessly craving for more. Remember the third precept, Hamesu Michachara, not just sexual, but sensual. When you use your wealth to abuse sensual pleasures, then that is not appropriate. The Buddha Dharma places great value on using your heart and wealth generously for the benefit of others. For example, supporting monasteries, charities, special need homes, etc. And you all are familiar with Dana Parami, giving without expecting anything in return. That is a central part of Buddhist ethics. Let us take a look at some historical examples. In the Buddha's lifetime, Ananda Pindika is a wealthy banker and he used his wealth, as you are aware, to buy the land for Jetavana Monastery and build Jetavana Monastery for the Buddha and the Sangha. Even today, when you go just outside the walls of Saraswati, 
you will still see the remnants of Jetavana Monastery. Anatta Pindika also provided meals for the monks, the sick, and other local people. And even when he had almost nothing left at the end of his life, he still continued to give what he could to others. King Bimbisara of Maganda is of the same age as the Buddha, and he was the first royal patron. In fact, he donated the very first monastery, Veluvana, for the Buddha and the Sangha. And he was a lifelong supporter of the early Sangha, the neonatal Sangha. Without him, the Buddha Sasana would not have flourished. And what about women? There is Visakha. Visakha is the daughter of a millionaire. And she was arranged to be married to the son of another millionaire. So she had wealth from both sides of her family. And she was a student of the Buddha Dharma and used her wealth to very good use, supporting the Sangha and in fact building another monastery, Puparama Monastery, on the other side of Saraswati. But Visakha's great contribution to our education of the Dhamma was how she taught her father-in-law. As I mentioned earlier, her father-in-law is a multimillionaire, rather arrogant one, and he was eating when the monk passed their house for arms round. He saw the monk, but he continued to eat, ignoring the monk. To him, they were parasites. So Visakha, politely told the monk, pass on, venerable sir. My father-in-law is eating stale food or overnight food. The father-in-law, of course, overheard the conversation and he was furious. How can a daughter-in-law insult him that way? And he called a council of his family members, the senior ones, wanting to expel Visaka from the family because of this insult. But Visaka explained to the council, Sirs, when my father-in-law ignored the monk and continued to eat his porridge, he was not making merit in this present life. He was only enjoying the merits of the past action a year ago, a month ago, ten years ago, a lifetime ago, we don't know. But he was just enjoying the fruits, the merits of what he has done. Is this not eating stale food? Remember, we have to keep on continuing to create wholesome acts and not just stop. And I think this is very important because many of you are working hard. Many of you are in the sunset years of your life and many of you are financially independent or comfortable. Do not just eat stale food or overnight food. Learn this lesson. Visaka's father-in-law was so impressed by Visaka's teaching that Visaka became not only a well-loved daughter-in-law, but he placed her now on a pedestal of great respect and consider her his teacher, his teacher. So, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, when all of us here understand that there is one denominator that every one of us will have, and that is aging, sickness, and death, none of us here can avoid this when you see this, some of us think that they are distant mountains. And that was how the Buddha described it. Many of us think, oh, these mountains are far away, long time, long time. But you will realize that even these distant mountains will move towards you and me 
like a tsunami, then you will want to do your best. The Buddha described it as like massive boulders, like an avalanche. These mountains of aging, sickness, and death, they will move in from all sides, crushing us. Aging and death will come rolling over every one of us. Whether you are a warrior, a priest, a merchant, a doctor, an engineer, a businessman, an employee, an employer, none of us will be spared. Because this massive avalanche will trample every one of us. So when you can understand this, you will want to do your best. Do not just eat overnight or stale food. So aging teaches us a lot of valuable lessons. But let us make sure that by the time you learn this lesson, it is not too late. For some people, by the time they learn their lesson, it is already too late. So a wise person will contemplate how, what means can I help society to be better? Because he realized he is part of society. Society is him. Society is not separate from him. And the Buddha wanted us to change for the better because we are the smallest unit of society. And when we change for our better, our family, which is a bigger unit, changes for the better. Our little condo changes for the better. And our society as a whole changes for the better. And the Buddha made it so clear when he said, if people knew, as I know, the fruits of sharing gifts they will not enjoy their use without sharing them. And even if it is their last bit, like Anatta Pindika, their last morsel of food, they will not enjoy its use without sharing it if there was someone else that they can share it with. So money can buy you happiness if you spend it wisely. No, if you just use it purely for self and sensual gratification, that is very, very transient. Use money well to support all the people who need it. And a good person, in all honesty, does not depend on what you claim your religion to be, how much you have in your bank account, or your status, whether doctor, not doctor, engineer, etc. Your skin color, your political views, or even your culture. Basically, it depends on how we treat others, and that is karma. So what is the meaning of life? Before too long, Dhamma family, life for all of us will end in death. This last few months, we saw so many famous Hong Kong actors and actresses live one by one. Whatever is worthwhile and good should be done without delay. This is the meaning of life. So you may ask, how? How do we act to help? It's so much unhappiness, sickness, and death in society. Now, Leo Tolstoy is one of the people I admire. He was from an aristocratic Russian family. But he saw Russia at its worst. With all the revolutions and wars, he saw famine, disaster, unhappiness, sickness, and death. We are not sure whether Tolstoy, in fact, met any monk, Buddhist monk. But certainly, his philosophy was greatly influenced by Buddha Dharma. And much of his writings and works reflect the Buddha Dharma. And here, Leo Tolstoy answers this question. How do you help with all the unhappiness, sickness, and death? He answered it by just three simple questions. When is the most important time? Now is the most important time. What is the most important thing to do? To do your best at this moment in time. No matter how small 
or how significant or insignificant it may appear. And who do you do it to? The person you are with now. Help that person, whether it is to improve his life, improve his speech, improve his presentation, improve his slides, improve his sharing. Whatever it is, even if it is just as the Buddha said, when you wash your bowl and there are a few grains of rice, pour it into the pond for the fish to eat. You have done what you can do now, the best you can do at this moment with the resources and to whoever or whomever you are with now. I think this is a wonderful lesson. Hence, when we are in a position to help, you are morally obliged to help. It is not a choice, but a responsibility. The present moment is all we have. Past has gone, future has not arrived. And in this moment, you and I have a choice to make a difference. So our progress should be in genuine happiness and not just in material sense. And in our search for meaning of life, in life, for life, let us be freed from the chains that we tie ourselves in. And are you aware, Dhamma family? I have said this so many times. The Buddha Dharma sets us free. It does not encase you in rites or rituals. It does not encase you in rules and regulations, but it gives you freedom to do what is good, what is wholesome based on your own will. Remember when the Buddha sent the first Arahants out, he told them, you are now free from all human and divine bondages. Human and divine bondages. Even divine bondages, you are free. You do not have to count out 108 times. You do not have to chant 108 times. Only if you see a reason for it, a meaning for it, then you do it. Certainly, you do not need to be a member of three golf clubs and drive two luxurious cars and have a mistress. These are chains that we tie ourselves in, in this measure of what we consider as success. So the Buddha has actually freed us you are now free, Dhamma family. This is an interesting word I learned many, many years ago. It must be at least 15, 20 years ago when a friend was in Germany. She wrote to me, do you have uncontrollable passion? passion? The German word, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Leidenschaft, means passion. And if you break the word down, my friend educated me. Laden means suffering. Shafen means to create. And she taught me, passion will create suffering. And the Buddha's teachings lead us to this passion. I found this interesting and I remember this all these years. But rich or poor, we are not omnipotent. And I think we have to also remember this. We should act when we can change an outcome. But we have to accept things as they are when we cannot. If not, you'll be a fool to knock your head against a wall. This is to allow us to achieve wisdom, equanimity, calmness, serenity, and peace of mind. Remember, when the Buddha tried to stop the quarrel between two groups of monks at Kosambi. He failed. The monks that were quarreling did not listen to the Buddha for advice. In fact, they said rather unpleasant things. And so what the Buddha did was actually walk away into the forest where he stayed for the wasa. So when we can change the outcome, we try. 
But when we realize that we are knocking our head on the wall and that the situation is beyond redemption, then we have to accept it. As, for example, a terminally ill person. This is wisdom. This is equanimity. This is calmness, serenity. So I repeat, when there is nothing you can do about a situation, a hopeless situation, then we do nothing. But when there is something we can do, let us do it. And the happiest people do not necessarily have a lot of wealth or the best of resources. They simply appreciate and use what they have along the way. And one of the greatest things the Buddha Dharma had taught us as an insurance for us to use is what is called thought diffusion. Your thoughts, my thoughts, are not necessarily me. We notice the thought, we observe the thought, we look at the thought, but we may not be that thought. We may not become what that thought says. We need not be that thought. That thought merely arose because of causes and conditions. You need not be that angry respond. You need not be that hurtful feeling unless you own it and choose to be. That is what Samatha and Vipassana meditation, what mindfulness and stillness teaches us. Now with wealth, you have freedom. Freedom from worry about your next meal, your electricity and water bill, your next installment. You have freedom from debts. You have freedom from having to pay for all kinds of things because you already have the resources ready. In fact, you may have the freedom to use whatever resources as you wish. So you must accept responsibility for that wish, that action, that behavior. Because sometimes when we are not mindful, we can make silly decisions to regret later. So the purpose of life, Dhamma family, is a life of purpose. And it is up to us individually, within our available resources, to create meaning in our lives. There is no fixed or predetermined direction for our lives. It is in our hands. And this is one of the things the Buddha clearly rejected with regards to predestination in karma. He obviously made this something to us that we can see, understand, realize is untrue. That teaching prevalent in the Buddha's time 2,600 years ago of fate or destiny or predetermination being called karma is something completely rejected by the Buddha. The Buddha instead taught us that what you create now will determine your future. Not fate, not destiny, not predetermination, not some god or gods, not some divine being, or where you are born, when you are born, or what time you are born. No, the Buddha clearly rejected all of this and placed that direction in our hands. So our lives and society will change the moment you decide to act. No matter how small it may appear, it will change. And all of us are familiar with that huge, huge container ship that got stuck at the Swiss Canal. That container ship is the size of the Empire State Building the length of four football fields. And how do they un unstuck or free it? Humble excavators working, digging, shoveling, bit by bit by bit. The Chinese say, uh, even a pillar of 
metal can be ground into a pin if we are determined. So when is enough for you? When can you say, I can now use my resources to help? Remember, Dharma family, even if you win the rat race, you are still a rat. So let us evolve beyond to a more higher form. Money by itself can't think or decide, neither is it good or evil. It is the people who use that money that is important, how we use that money. And we can change and we will change. We will change, I have illustrated here. We can change, it's up to us. Let us look at the criteria. Checklist. Are you so greedy for money that if you are a businessman or an investor, that it justify any means of acquiring it? Or are you earning your money by the sweat of your brow and the strength of your arms without breaking the five basic moral precepts? Tick the box. So is it righteous wealth, righteously earned? If it is, by all means, use it for the comfort of family, self, relatives, friends, for the needy, for the worthy. Enjoy the arts, festivals and food, but perform acts of generosity, kindness and courage too. See the funny parts of our lives. As you walk the Buddha's path, you will become happier and happier, not more and more morose, sad, unhappy, depressed, Something is wrong because remember the first noble truth and the second noble truth. The first noble truth tells us the fact of dukkha. The second noble truth tells us the causes of dukkha. As you let go of those causes of dukkha, you will become happier because now you have less dukkha. And finally, when greed, anger, delusion, or ignorance is no more, you will have this state of Nibbana, the supreme happiness. So no one ever said you cannot enjoy your life. Enjoy your birthday cake, moon cake, whatever cake that you have, unless of course you're a diabetic, then do limit it. So rich or poor, let us be not short-sighted. And the instant you realize the truths, you will dedicate yourself to helping others. It will be the natural progression. So remember, Dhamma family, none of us here can live forever. Life is one thing we cannot get out of a life. And I've always said how I wish everyone knows exactly when he or she will die. So if you know exactly then you will definitely live your life differently. The wise one will use it well. The unwise one with blindness or just one eye will just have sensual gratification and pleasures and be drifting along. We can't take anything with us when we die. Let's be very clear. But you can leave a little bit of yourself behind that made a difference help someone become better for a better tomorrow for everyone we do our best today including getting your covid vaccine i've been asked so many times by people oh should i get the covid vaccine what if i have this side effect that side effect this that that and the list goes on my standard answer dhamma family and i will say it here the covid vaccine is not for you. The COVID vaccine is for all the people that you love, for your family, for the elderly in your family, for the children in your family, for your son who is doing business, for your university students to have a job, for society, for country, for the economic survival of this nation. That COVID vaccine is for everyone for a better tomorrow. So when you can see it that way, then you realize 
there is nothing to talk about as far as side effect is concerned. You, for a better tomorrow, will do what you need to do today. So rich or poor, be at peace with one and all. Let us not have quarrels. Let us not have, un have hurt feelings that is remaining forever. Let us forgive, forget if possible. And let our lives, spiritual, material, working, let it all be one. Our lives can be spiritual by just making sure we keep the five precepts and leaving with metta karuna. And within our ability and our resources, dana, generosity. So our actions speak so loud. No one can hear what we say, because when deeds speak, words are nothing. How loud are your actions? And here again, I place on record, I am very grateful to the people within this team who have been managing the IT aspects of our sharing. Without them, this would not have been possible the last half year. And I'm very grateful to them. Now, I think I want to end by reminding us, do not be the richest man in the cemetery. What is the point? Many things in our lives is beyond our control. When we fall sick, when we decay, when we have cancer, etc., and die, much of it is beyond our control. But our response to whatever that we are facing now whether good health, whether good resources, whether sickness, decay, whether illness, curable or incurable, our response to it is in our hands. So I remind ourselves again, including myself, do not be the richest man in the cemetery. And do not forget, even the rich suffer. Even the rich have lots of mental stress. You have seen celebrities commit suicide. You have seen celebrities lead miserable lives. And of course, I think every one of us here using a Mac computer like me, we remember Steve Jobs who had cancer and died very young. So he too said that being the richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter to him. What is important is has he done anything that is useful. So rich, poor, Buddhist, non-Buddhist, all will similarly experience failure, aging, sickness, and death. For the Buddhists, the Buddha Dharma had given us skills, living skills, on how to handle these. Disappointments and failures are inevitable. But with right view, with the right understanding of anicca, impermanence, Dukkha, dissatisfaction, and anatta, non-self. You, with right wheels, are more armed, equipped to handle these disappointments and not fall into disillusion, cynicism, and pessimism. We can still continue to grow. In the end, Dharma family, what you think, what you know, what you believe in, even what religion you call yourself, what yana you label yourself, is frankly of very little consequence. If you truly understand the Buddha Dharma, you will really understand that the only consequence is what you do. Whether you have walked the Eightfold Path, whether you have lived with Metta, Karuna, Mudita, Upeka, whether you have understood Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta, that is important. What you put in your IC card, what you claim that your center follows, all that in the end is frankly irrelevant. So the truly rich smile without condition, walk without grief, give without expectation of return, and care similarly without expectation. 
And remember the very first lesson the Buddha taught, not in words, but in action. Gratitude. You do not become educated without teachers. You do not become skilled in whatever profession without mentors. You do not become rich without appropriate conditions. You do not become rich without customers. These many, many causes and conditions gave rise to what you and I have today. If you are financially independent, financially comfortable, you are so because of so many things that had contributed to it. Be grateful. For me, to this day, I am grateful to all my teachers in medical school. I am grateful to all the teachers I had when I was working, all the consultants who treated me as their son, their child, and to all the people who had walked with me up to today, my Kayana meters, they all are the web that made me what I am today. Now, I want to let you be shocked that RIP, that we so often say when someone passed away, may turn out to be either a good or a terrible career move because RIP does not mean rest in peace. If you have acted well, if you have done well, you will be reborn in prosperity, in peace, in plenty, in plentitude, in profusion, in paradise, in pleasure, in wisdom, Anya. But if you had done the opposite, you may well be reborn in purgatory. So please remember when we say RIP, it does not mean rest in peace. And remember how important this slide is. So whether rich or poor, let us not worry about the unknown future, but use the known present well with, our, with whatever resources that we have. And remember the Mangala Sutta, when faced with all the ups and downs of life, still the mind remains unshaken, not lamenting, not generating defilement, always feeling secure. This is the greatest happiness. You are the richest man on earth. So I want to remind you of what the Venerable Thich Nhat Han said. You know he has been very ill for a long time. He has gone back to Vietnam to his home temple, the original temple where he was ordained. And one of his disciples built a stupa saying that when he finally passed away, they will put his ashes in the stupa. And Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh wrote this when he knew about it. He said, Please do not build a stupa for me. Please do not put my ashes in a vase. Lock me inside and limit who I am. I know this will be difficult for some of you. If you must build a stupa though, please make sure that you put a sign on it that says, I am not in here. In addition, you can also put another sign that says, I am not out there either. And a third sign that says, if I am anywhere, it is in your mindful breathing and in your peaceful steps. The next sharing on next Thursday, Friday, the next breaking myth sharing on next Friday, will explain this few lines. Religion, Dharma family, is in the life that we live. Dana, Sila, Bhavana. Not in the creed that we profess. Religion is in the life that we live. How much generosity, not just in terms of money, but in terms of your skill, your knowledge, whatever you can do to help your wisdom, your sharing, 
your IT skills, or even just volunteering to wash plates in the temple kitchen. That's dana. Sila, our precepts, and bhavana, training our mind, understanding dukkha, understanding the causes of dukkha, that is craving, craving for continuation and craving for no, not continuation, and of course, understanding anicca, dukkha, anatta, the three universal characteristics. It is not in what we officially label ourselves. That's called our creed. What you label yourself has no meaning the instant you die because what you label yourself does not carry forward. It is only your karma vipaka. You are born of your karma. You are the heir of your karma. You are related by your karma. With that Dhamma family, I say thank you. Sadhu, sadhu for that wonderful talk. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Puna. Well, the, this topic is definitely very relevant to all of us because we are all working for money and uh, we are trying to get more and more. Then to, to, tonight, I, I have picked up a very interesting statement here. Do not be the richest man in the cemetery. Uh, that was a very good one. I don't know where you come out with this. This is wonderful, wonderful. Well, uh, right, Dr. Puna, I, this, uh, I think that there's uh, one part of it is that if a person becomes very rich by working very hard, but not paying his workers fairly as what you mentioned, and also, the, the boss of the business is engaged in unwholesome business practices. But he does a lot of dana for the sangha, charity to the old folks, homes, orphanage, etc. The question is, can this person be able to cultivate himself well following the path as taught by the Buddha? Thank you. Brother Chuan, that's a good question. And the Buddha had actually answered this many a times in the discourses. Mm -hmm. Now we, in our very simplistic thinking, label karma as, let's say, white and black. Okay, so we think of it as good and bad. But actually the Buddha taught us that there are four categories. First, you got what is obviously very nasty. You go around doing terrible things, robbing, killing, etc. And of course, the other extreme, you go around doing a lot of good things. No doubt this is real altruism. But the Buddha said a lot of things are done creating karma, which is both black and white, which means gray. And what did the Buddha mean when he said that there are a lot of people who will create, which is both black and white. And this is like what Brother Chuan described. There are a lot of people who have generated wealth through not very pleasant means. We will not go into the details. But they are generous. They will say, oh, you need money, should help. Sure, 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 I'll support. You need old folks home, need money, sure, I'll support. So he creates a mixture of both. And for many people, we do so-called good things, but with selfish intention. Ah, I raise money, but uh -huh, in return, uh, I expect uh, Subang Jaya must give me a room. Ah, uh, uh, my name must put up prominently. Uh, then, you know, at the dinner, uh, you must make sure I get caught on stage, you know, big check, big photograph, publicity. So, a lot of us have what we call a mixture. Then the Buddha said there is the karma which leads to the end of karma, which is, of course, the perfect one, and that is walking the Eightfold Path where you want to have the end of karma. Remember, awakening, where you no longer reborn, is actually the end of karma. That means karma no longer has an effect on you. And the question people will raise, you know what will happen to these people? Well, what will happen to these people is because they have a mixture of good deeds 
and not good deeds, they become born in environments which are like that. Now, before I even dare to say the next statement, I have to ensure that everybody knows that karma is very complicated. It is a very intricate court. You know, you see telecom, uh, they open that, that stupa-like structure and you look at the cables inside, you wonder how the man can sort out which cable is which. But it's really very complicated because it is over a long period of time and it is all intertwined. So we might say, oh, that man may be born as an animal in a rich family, you know, oh, one of those pedigree dogs in a rich family who probably have a more comfortable life than many poor people, etc., etc. Or he may be born into a not so good environment and then receive good support later on, etc., etc. But all these, I must say, is speculation because none of us can actually understand or unravel it. To unravel it into, oh, because he did very good deeds, that's why he has a comfortable life. Oh, he did very bad deeds, that's how he ended up as a dog. That's oversimplistic. We are merely using this as an example, that mm -hmm. there is a mixture of both. All right, Brother Chuan? Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, then there's, um, so carry on with another question. Uh, that is from, ah, okay, from Putra Heights. Uh, but the call, the Buddha spoke of the different types of people, blind, one eye, two eye. The two-eyed person knows how to acquire health and how to distinguish between good and evil. The Buddha doesn't seem to give a lot of detailed teachings on how to acquire wealth. Why does he not give more detailed teachings on acquiring wealth? Brother call the Buddha did give a lot of teachings on how wealth is acquired and how wealth is dissipated. Um, it is not within the context of this talk for me to actually go into those details, but mm -hmm. please believe me, the Buddha did give a lot of teachings. Um, no money, how you earn money. After you earn money, how that money is dissipated and among which is of course is mixing with bad friends, womanizing, etc. So the Buddha did teach quite a lot. Now, I think that it is important that as part of the answer to your question, you must understand the Mangala Sutta. The Mangala Sutta is often translated as blessings. That is not accurate because blessings in our present culture implies that Brother Chuan give me something. And in the Mangala Sutta, it does not imply that at all. In the Mangala Sutta is 38 so-called blessings for lack of a better word. But they are mm. actually conditions, auspicious conditions for a person to flourish, to do well and be a noble person. So for example, when you are a young person, a teenager, not to associate with fools, but to associate with the wise becomes very, very important. Because if you associate with wrong people, wrong company, you are going to go down. And then it goes on to saying you must have vast learning. Okay, today we will say, oh, you must at least have a profession, educated highly, etc., trained well. And you must be skilled in handicraft, which today means you must be skilled in IT, skilled in surgery, whatever. And then you have to provide for family. So you can see that within the Mangala Sutta is a map, a road map that begins from your training all the way. And this includes discipline, not mixing with the wrong company, education, training in skills to support family, wife, uh, singular. Uh. All others are plural. Uh. It talks about parents, it talks about children, but wife is in singular. Okay? Support them. And of course, after that, it goes on to learning the Dhamma, etc. So, how to earn wealth? First, don't mix with wrong company. Mix with the correct company. Learn how to have, must have education. You must have skills. If you've got no marketable skill, how are you going to earn a living? So, as I said, beyond that, there are also other suttas, which I'm not able to quote offhand right now. But I assure you, if you just Google it, it's all there. Okay, there are so many suttas that the Buddha had given us advice on how to earn wealth, 
maintain that wealth and not squander it. Thank you. Right. Uh, let's go to the next question. Oh, from Brother Hai Ying. How do we test from money? Since everything our worldly life needs money, cash is king in worldly life. So. Yeah, of course. How, how are you going to feed your family and yourself if you've got no money? Obviously, yeah. you need money. Please mm. do not walk away the impression that the Buddha Dharma tells you that you should not have money. No, no, no. The Buddha Dharma tells you no one owes you a living. That's why I said in the Mangala Sutta, you have to have education. You have to make sure you don't mix with the wrong people. You make sure you have a profession. You make sure you support your family, your parents, etc. You need money for that. Mm. And what it teaches you is to what our buddha dharma teaches us is to earn that money righteously without breaking the five precepts now what we do not want is for you to be the one eye man that means in the pursuit of wealth you are willing to do anything then the buddha said you will enjoy sensual pleasures because you have accumulated wealth but you are creating a lot of unwholesome deeds, unwholesome karma, and of course, every act has consequences. Okay? All right. Can we, uh, can we have the next question? Ah, from Leong Yu Ming, <clears throat> your brother can elaborate more on spiritual formula of how we should spend our hard-earned money and how we should save and invest. Brother Yu Ming, Good evening. <laughs> Brother Yu Ming is a dedicated follower. <laughs> yeah, every, every, every of your sharing. <laughs> yeah, you must show me his picture, you know. I don't know how it looks like, you know. You must post his picture there. <laughs> but Brother Yu Ming, again, the Buddha had given us a lot of advice on how to spend our money. For example, at least half of it is to be invested. That's actually a very high proportion. And half of it should be have for emergency, oh, sorry, one quarter for emergencies and one quarter to use for mm. your needs. Mm. So yes, in the Sigala Vada Sutta, the Buddha will, uh, has taught very clearly how that money should be used and saved. Now, it even tells you to protect it from kings and thieves mm. and floods and fires. Huh? So I interpret it as buy insurance huh? and make sure you get a good accountant to do your income tax, all right? Because, um, you know, those days they say protect it from kings and thieves, fire and floods. Now, fire and flood, of course, today is insurance. Mm -hmm. Kings and thieves. Kings, make sure you get a good accountant. Thieves, well, that's a bit difficult given our present context. So, yes, Brother Yu Ming, uh, the Buddha did teach us. You want the exact proportion? Oh, it's easy. Just look up Sigalo Wada Sutta. It is in there. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. Thank you. Well, yes. Well, well, questions are all coming in. Yes. Uh, let's go for the next question. Hey, let me see. Oh, all right. From Putra Heights, about the call again. Uh, the Buddha Dharma sets us free. Yet for many of us, generating and multiplying wealth is an exhausting affair. It tends to entangle and chain us further. We become trapped in this pursuit of more. We become entangled in the struggle for greater income opportunities and make money making tools. How do we pursue wealth yet in a freer way? How do we continue to taste the liberating experience of the Dharma even amidst our effort to gain wealth? Brother Ko, good evening. What you're asking me is the easy way to become rich. Well, I can tell you the easiest way to become rich, have a rich father and a rich mother. That's the easiest way to become rich. Then you don't have to work so hard. And of course, there's always this joke that we laugh. You know, I told you, uh, Buddhists are not, you know, solemn people cannot laugh, cannot joke. No, 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 that's not true. You see, Brother Chuan is so happy. You know, have, of course, this is a joke. Huh? Please take it as a joke. We always used to have this joke. That if your father and your mother is poor, uh, what can you do? Uh? 
But if your father-in-law and your mother-in-law are poor, then you chose badly, lah. Okay. <laughs> so, brother, call if you're asking me for the easiest way to have wealth, ah, that joke would be the answer I can give you, lah. Okay. But other than that, most of us have to work hard. That's why you need vast learning. You need a skill. But the pursuit of wealth, while important, must be balanced by your spiritual life. If your pursuit of wealth is so overwhelming that all you care about is money, I can also tell you you will not be very happy. All right, you need a balance. Nobody owns us a living. Money, if it is so easily earned, everybody will be rich. Okay, the fact is that you need skills, marketable skills. No point having a skill which is not marketable. And then, of course, when people know you are a good, decent person. With knowledge, with marketable skills, people will come to you. All right, there are people with the same skills, just like you, who will be promoting themselves. But why do people choose you over another person? Partly because they know you are a good person, okay, that you are a good man, and that they trust you. So I wish I can tell you that this is the magic formula, but I tell you the only answers I can tell. That involves getting wealthy without working hard or striving very hard is to either inherit it or marry into it. Beyond those two, well, be like the rest of us, work very hard to be financially comfortable. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. How about uh, how about talking about the possible karmic effects of a person who is uh. Very generous to use his uh, well to support the uh, Vihara or the Sangha community, but he's unwilling and uh, very stingy and not happy to help the poor or the needy. Needy, what would be the possible coming effect on that person? Well, it's it's actually beyond me to tell you what will happen to him because, as I said, the effects of karma are extremely complex. Mm. He will be what we call a mixture. Grey or black, neither black nor white, in between, and only he knows the reasons behind why he is willing to support the Vihara and the Sangha. Maybe you see, he's what we call a spiritual investor. He yeah. is investing like investing in shares, and he sees investing in the poor, the needy, the handicapped as very poor return. So this is not dana parami. This is spiritual investment thinking that by Dana one thousand, I get back ten thousand. In which case, of course, that is wrong view. Huh? Okay, but we honestly do not know his reasons. I mean, let's be very frank, Brother Chuan. You come to exam season, every mother will be coming to the center to offer, because they are thinking if I do this offer, ah, then my son, my daughter will have good exam results, blah blah blah, etc. It's it's very common for all of us to think along those lines. Some, of course, quite. Simplistic and naive, lah. But there are actually people who think that if I donate a hundred, I will get back a thousand. I mean, I don't want to name names, but there are actually people who believe that. All right, this is another entire philosoph philosophy altogether. That I give one thousand, I will get ten thousand. That that sort of thinking, which is of course not in tune with the Buddha Dharma. All right, thank you. Oh, we have. Uh, I think we have one. Do we have any more question? Ah, uh, yes, from Shurai, like Abra Ko, who spoke on the different types of people. Okay, we already uh, had this already. We asked this question already. Uh, yeah, we already asked this question already. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. let's remove it. Mm. Let's see. Uh, Ah, okay, there's one coming in. Very cool. Sometimes in practice of generosity, we don't want to give because we feel like we don't have enough. You know, I will give when I have more. How should we deal with these thoughts? No, but the call is fine because only you know whether you have enough. I mean, you may have lots of responsibilities, and in which case, please don't give money. Give other things: your skill, your time, your efforts, your knowledge. All right. I mean, as I mentioned, I'm very grateful to the IT team. You know, we have a strong and big IT team supporting this breaking news series for the last half year. 
they have generously given of their skills. I have absolutely no idea how to do all this cross-posting. It is all set up by them. Every Friday, they are on standby. And of course, before that, they had to go through all that works, rehearsals, etc. So they are not Ghana in terms of money, but they are giving Ghana of their skill and very important of their time. Brother Cole, do you realize you can give money? You can always earn back the money. You can even make 10 times the amount if you are skillful. But if you have given time, you will never be able to get it back. Even if it is just giving two hours breaking me every Friday, that two hours is gone forever. So as far as mundane dana is concerned, time is very valuable because once given, is lost forever. The highest gift, of course, is the gift of the Dhamma. And I keep saying, now it's 2021. I have shared for 21 years, official basis. Before that was unofficial. I have actually learned more from this 21 years of sharing. I have probably indirectly gain rather than lost if you are always an accountant balancing balance sheets because in teaching i actually learn far more than i would have had i not been teaching so i am very grateful and i keep on saying to my audience to people because they gave me this opportunity the buddha said the highest gift is the gift of the dhamma the people who sit here now, 298 of you, have given me that opportunity to do what I can do. Okay. Now, money is the most obvious thing when people come to think of dana. And of course, there are many things that require money. Never, never belittle it. That we do within our means. And what is within our means is very individual. Okay. Well, your responsibilities are a lot, then please don't make your family suffer because of your enthusiasm to dana money. Dana other things. Time, as I said. I'm sure Brother Chuan agrees with me. One of the most difficult things is to get people to commit. People say, okay, I volunteer next week. Bo tai chi. Then you say every week for the next one year, can or not, people will say, you mad. How can? So it is actually very difficult. All right, for a dana of time on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. Sadhu, sadhu. Well, we have come to the end of uh, this uh, wonderful session, uh, this wonderful sharing by Dr. Puna Wong. 